In this topic, we'll be introducing lab exercise 12, human genetics. Before we can get into the details of human genetics, we need to talk about the basics that genetics is all derived from, and that's from DNA. So DNA is a type of molecule. It's called a nucleic acid. Um, you will not need to know that term for testing purposes, but just in case you encounter it in your reading or in the future. It's called a nucleic acid and contains the instructions for life. It has the instructions to make all the different proteins that exist in the body. And DNA is a very, very, very long molecule in our cells. To prevent it from getting all tangled up into a mess that's hard to access, what happens is our cells are going to wrap that DNA around proteins. And by wrapping it around proteins and wrapping it again, you can form these structures that are called chromosomes. So chromosomes are really associations of DNA and proteins to keep that DNA organized. I like to think of it if you have a string of lights, say, I don't know, Christmas lights. If you don't celebrate Christmas, I apologize, but any string of lights will do. Um, when you go to take them down, you can bunch them up into a ball and then just throw them in the closet. Next time you want to use them, it takes a long time to untangle them. Or you can wrap them neatly, like in a circle, around your arm, and then it makes that much easier next time to unravel and use. The same is true with DNA. Neat, orderly wrapping makes it easy to unwrap it when we need to use that DNA. Every molecule of DNA, or excuse me, every chromosome, consists of a single molecule of DNA that's very, very, very long. And we'll talk about how many different chromosomes there are on, on the, in the body, in different cells, and then that means that there's those many different molecules of DNA in those cells as well. <clears throat> so we have 24 different chromosomes. Down here you can see they're labeled number 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up through 22. That's the first 22. And then XY, that makes 24 different chromosomes. And again, all of the DNA that makes us human is divided up amongst these 24 chromosomes. So each chromosome has a different, unique part of DNA that makes us who we are. We can take these 24 chromosomes and split them into two different groups. The first group has the majority of the chromosomes in it. They are called autosomes. So chromosomes that are numbered. 1 through 22, we call those the autosomes. And then the remaining two chromosomes, the X and Y, we call those the sex chromosomes. We'll talk about why we call those the sex chromosomes in a little bit. One thing to note that students, uh, some students tend to get confused about is that sex chromosomes not equal to. So this line through an equal sign means not equal to. So be very careful when you're reading a question, you don't get these things confused. Sex chromosomes are protein and DNA associated together, specifically the X and the Y chromosomes. Sex cells are sperm and egg cells, which contain all of these different chromosomes in them. Well, not all of them, but We'll talk about what they have in them. They have the chromosomes inside of those cells. So most of the cells in our body contain pairs of similar chromosomes, and we'll talk about why they come in pairs. These paired chromosomes are very similar, nearly identical. They have the same length, the same position of things called genes, which we'll talk about later, and other structures that make that chromosome uh, look the way it does. So the term we use to describe these two similar paired chromosomes is homologous. You may also just hear them called homologs. Um, homologs is spelled G-U-E-S or just H-O-M-O-L-O-G-S. Either way, homologs, homologs. <clears throat> 
So the reason that we have pairs is because one of those chromosomes in the homologous pair you got from your father, and the other one you got from your mother. They're always contributing one of each homologous chromosome from each of your two parents. And these are in most of the cells of our body. So what do we call most of the cells of our body? Well, we call them body cells. Big surprise there. Uh, we also refer to them as somatic cells. So body cells are called somatic cells. They're the same thing. So which cells do these include? Well, these are all the cells in the body except for a couple of them. Uh, the ones that are not included in this category are the sex cells and mature red blood cells. We'll talk about those both next. So that means you know, neurons, which are brain cells, skin cells, liver cells, um, bone cells, epithelial cells, etc. Those are all body cells. So every body cell has two copies, so homologs, of each of the 22 autosomes. So 2 times 22 makes 44, plus a pair of sex chromosomes, either XX or XY. So 44 plus 2 gives us a total of 46 chromosomes. This is in a genetically normal individual. There are conditions, like Down syndrome for example, where instead of having you know, two copies of chromosome 21, you have an extra copy, you have three copies. That means that now you'd have 47 chromosomes. You would not have the normal number, which is considered to be 46. Another thing to point out, the pair of sex chromosomes you have determines biologically whether you are male or female. If you have, you can see here, XX, that means you are female. If you're XY, you are biologically male. Moving on now to the sex cells. Sex cells, like I said before, are sperm and egg. Another name for an egg is an ovum. The plural of that is ova. We'll talk later about ovaries, ovulation, all relates to eggs. Because the sex cells, you can see in this picture down here, a sperm and egg come together in fertilization to make a single cell that then eventually turns into you. Each of those you want to have half as much genetic information, only 23 chromosomes. So when 23 and 23 come together, now you have the normal 46. What that means is the sex cells have one copy of each of the different autosomes plus only one of the sex chromosomes, either an X or a Y for a grand total then of 23 chromosomes. So females don't have a Y chromosome. What that means is in each of a woman's eggs, she has 22 autosomes. They're not shown in this picture. Plus an X chromosome. Males, however, have X and Y. So in each sperm cell, you're going to have 22 autosomes and then plus either the X or the Y. And so that means the sex of the baby is determined by which sperm cell is able to fertilize the egg. If the X containing sperm fertilizes the egg, now you have XX, you have a female, biologically. If the Y carrying sperm is able to fertilize that egg, now you have XY, you have a male, biologically. Here's a short video talking about now an introduction to genetics in a broader way, and we'll talk about these terms a little bit further as we continue. These days, scientists know how you inherit characteristics from your parents. They're able to calculate probabilities of having a specific trait or getting a genetic disease according to the information they have from the parents and the family history. But how is this possible? To understand how traits pass from one living being to its descendants, we need to go back in time to the 19th century and a man named Gregor Mendel. <laughs> 
Mendel was an Austrian monk and biologist who loved to work with plants. By breeding the pea plants he was growing in the monastery's garden, he discovered the principles that rule heredity. In one of the most classic examples, Mendel combined a purebred yellow-seeded plant with a purebred green-seeded plant, and he got only yellow seeds. He called the yellow color trait the dominant one because it was expressed in all the new seeds. Then he let the new yellow-seeded hybrid plants self-fertilize, and in this second generation he got both yellow and green seeds, which meant that the green trait had been hidden by the dominant yellow. He called this hidden trait the recessive trait. From those results, Mendel inferred that each trait depends on a pair of factors, one of them coming from the mother and the other from the father. Now we know that these factors are called alleles and represent the different variations of a gene. Depending on which type of allele Mendel found in each seed, we can have what we call a homozygous P, where both alleles are identical, and what we call a heterozygous P, when the two alleles are different. This combination of alleles is known as genotype, and its result, being yellow or green, is called phenotype. To clearly visualize how alleles are distributed amongst descendants, we can use a diagram called the Punnett square. You just place the different alleles on both axes, and then you figure out the possible combinations. Let's look at Mendel's P's, for example. Let's write the dominant yellow allele as an uppercase Y, and the recessive green allele as a lowercase Y. The uppercase Y always overpowers his lowercase friend, so the only time you get green babies is if you have two lowercase Ys. In Mendel's first generation, the yellow homozygous P mom will give each P kid a yellow dominant allele, and the green homozygous P dad will give a green recessive allele, so all the P kids will be yellow heterozygous. Then, in the second generation, where the two heterozygous kids marry, their babies could have any of the three possible genotypes, showing the two possible phenotypes in a three-to-one proportion. But even peas have a lot of characteristics. For example, besides being yellow or green, peas may be round or wrinkled. So we could have all these possible combinations, round yellow peas, round green peas, wrinkled yellow peas, and wrinkled green peas. To calculate the proportions for each genotype and phenotype, we can use a Punnett square too. Of course, this will make it a little more complex. And lots of things are more complicated than peas, like, say, people. These days, scientists know a lot more about genetics and heredity, and there are many other ways in which some characteristics are inherited. But it all started with Mendel and his peas. Okay, so that video mentioned a number of things. Uh, one of those was genes. So a gene is just a part of our DNA. And because our DNA is wrapped around and associated with proteins into these structures called chromosomes, you find genes as part of the DNA on a chromosome. And each gene ultimately codes for the production of a single protein. So for example, we all have a gene, let's say, hypothetically, that controls the shape of our chin, whether it's smooth, kind of rounded, or it's got a little cleft, a little indentation in the center. So every person has this gene, every human being. However, we all don't have the same shape to our chin. So what we have are different alleles. This word can be hard for students to pronounce. A, uh, li, o, a uh, leal. Alleles are variations of genes. So they are that sequence of DNA but there are small changes. So there's these letters here that represent the code in our DNA that makes up the um, information for that specific gene. And here we've got, this one's got CAT for its code, this one's got TCA. Those slight changes make those different alleles, different versions of that gene. One of these alleles codes for the smooth chin, other one codes, codes for the indentation, the cleft chin. So what that means is, contrary to what you may have heard, human beings all have the same genes. Every human being has the same genes as every other human being. What's different are our alleles. Even though we all have the genes that control these things, we have different versions of those genes. So we have the same genes, but different versions, different alleles for those genes. And that's what makes us different. So remember, we said in our body cells, we have two copies of each chromosome. And then for sex chromosomes, either XX or XY. What that means then is we have two alleles for every gene in those cells. 
So the combination of alleles you contain in those cells is referred to as your genotype. So in this example here, we have a W allele and a B allele. W for white feathers, B for black feathers. So WW is one genotype, BB is another, and BW is the third possibility. Now, depending on that genotype and other factors, including the environment, this can have observable characteristics that can develop. Those are called your phenotype. Phenotype is what you can see, the effect of the genotype. It's a short way to kind of think about it. The phenotype, this is the effect of the genotype plus the environment. We'll talk later about how the environment plays a role, more so in, um, in lecture. So the color of those chicken's feathers depends on the genotype. The phenotype is the color of their feathers. So now we need to talk about what are called dominance relationships. Right now, I'll be focusing on complete dominance, looking at how the alleles interact within that pair. So with complete dominance, one allele is completely dominant compared to the other allele or alleles, and the other one, those are recessive. So what does that mean, dominant versus recessive? Well, if an allele is dominant, it means it can't hide. Its effect always shows up in the phenotype, no matter how many copies there are. If you have one or two copies of the dominant allele, it still shows its effect in the phenotype. This is in contrast to the recessive allele. The recessive allele is always hidden in the phenotype, unless both of those copies are recessive. That means if you have one dominant, one recessive, the dominance always going to show itself, but the recessive would be hidden in that case because recessive only shows if that's all you have is recessive. If they're both dominant or one's dominant, recessive is hidden. To indicate dominant and recessive, we use capital letters, uppercase letters for dominant, and lowercase, small letters for recessive. Kind of, you can think about the small lowercase letter it's present with the dominant letter, kind of be hidden by that dominant letter. So you might, might not be able to see that recessive one because the big one hides it. So now let's go ahead and apply this information. So on the right-hand side here, you'll see some information talking about how you're able to perceive taste. We're not going to focus on that in this class, but you're welcome to read about it more if you'd like. But we're going to talk about the genetics behind it. We have found that there's a specific gene that plays a significant role in whether or not you can taste a certain harmless chemical called phenylthiocarbamide, you do not need to know that name, uh, or PTC for short. And the gene that controls whether you can taste this is found on chromosome number 7. That number is not important, but it's important that chromosome 7 is an autosome. Remember that autosomes were chromosomes number 1 through 22. Because of that, the term we use to describe this trait or characteristic is we say it's an autosomal trait, denoting that the gene is found on one of the autosomes. And that'll come into play a little bit later. Because it's an autosomal trait, that means you have two copies of it, one from mom, one from dad, as we can see here. If this dad has all of these dominant alleles, one of those has to be given to make this son and the mom has these recessive, one of those is given to make the son. Same thing with the daughter. One of those is given to make the daughter, and one of the moms is given to make the daughter as well. Because the ability to taste this harmless chemical PTC is a dominant trait, we say that this trait is autosomal dominant. That means that no matter if you have two copies of the dominant allele, or just one, the dominant still shows its effect. They all can taste PTC. 
The only way you cannot taste it is if both are recessive like the mother is here. But both being recessive, now she cannot taste PTC. So it's the dominant allele that shows us then, or dominant trait, that shows us that having no matter one or two copies, you still are showing that trait. A few other terms here to introduce. Homozygous, homozygous and heterozygous. The term homozygous means that in your pair of alleles, both are the same. So here you can have two capital letters, homozygous dominant. Two lowercase letters would be homozygous recessive. Or you could have one of each, a big and a small, the two different ones. We call that heterozygous. The prefix homo means same, and hetero means different. One thing you'll be going through in the lab exercise is pedigrees. Pedigrees are basically like a family tree, but instead of just looking at the names of your parents, grandparents, and so on, it's looking at a specific trait and how that trait is passed down from one generation to the next or how it may appear to skip a generation. It might not show itself visibly in a generation. And so there are some conventions that are always followed in a pedigree. These are written down in your lab book, but I want to go through them. One is that circles always indicate females. See down here? Circles are females. Squares indicate males. If it's darkened in, that means they are showing the trait that you're looking at. They have that trait. They're showing that trait. If it's white, it's not darkened in, that means they are not showing that trait. Other things to note. A line going straight from one individual to the next with no bends in it, that indicates a sexual relationship between those individuals. So grandma and grandpa here got it on, right? Uh, disturbing, but it happened, right? Uh, anyway, uh, if a line comes down from that, sometimes it's going like this, a single line down, that's a child that came from that. In this case here, this line comes down, it goes down to more lines. They had one, two, three children. Some of those children then had sexual relationships and had children of their own. What that means then is that these are our siblings right here. There's not a straight line connected to them, not a sexual relationship. This denotes that they are, in this case, brother and sister. So my question to you is over here, this is you, what would your relationship be to either of these individuals here with the question marks? So go ahead and pause it, take a minute to see if you can figure out that, and then we'll discuss it. Okay, so here, your father, this was his brother, and this was his sister. So this is your aunt and uncle, and they have kids with other spouses. That means those are your cousins. First cousin, but we'll say cousins, good enough. So how now can we use pedigrees to figure out what people's genotypes are? So in this case here, we're going to look for the genotypes, the combination of alleles that are present in these individuals. So with this one, we're looking at a PTC taster pedigree. It reminds us this trait is autosomal, so it's two copies of um, each allele, and it's a dominant trait. That means that individuals darkened in are showing this dominant trait in this case. So here is a PTC taster, and so is this one. These two that are not darkened in are non-tasters. They can't taste it. So we need to think about, well, if we're using the letter T's here, we have three options. Two big T's, a big T and a small T, and two small T's. Okay? This being a dominant trait, both of these are tasters they can taste this PTC because they have at least one copy of the dominant allele. This one here is a non-taster because they don't have the dominant allele. They cannot taste this. Um, that's the case. So when you're filling out a pedigree for the genotypes, start with the individuals that only have one option. That would be the non-tasters. So these ones that are not darkened in, they're the non-tasters. They have to have 
two small t's as a genotype. Otherwise, if they had a big T, they'd be darkened in because they'd be tasters. Now these over here, they could be one of two things, two of the big T's or a big and a small. What those have in common is they must have at least one dominant letter. And then we'll try to figure out what their second one must be. So to figure out the second allele, sometimes you look at their children, other times you look at their parents. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So down here, um, this son, square, right, male, son, got one of these letters from his mom. The other one could not have come from his mom. It's always one from each parent. You can't make a baby without two parents, male and female. And so the other one has to then have come from his dad. That tells us his dad must be heterozygous, two different alleles, big T and a small t. And now here, here we have a daughter who's a taster. We don't know what her second allele is. Who did she get this big T from? Well, that big T came from her dad. That means the other allele has to have come from her mom, which means that the small T then came from the mom. And that's how you can figure out the alleles or the genotypes for individuals in a pedigree. We're going to do a lot of this in lecture as well. Um, it's going to show up in the lecture test, lab quiz, very, very important stuff to know well, so make sure you get lots of practice with this. We'll also work out probabilities. So if we say you've got a parent who's a taster and another one who's a non-taster, what's the percent chance they'll have a kid who's a non-taster? To solve these pedigree problems, one of the most common tools is a Punnett square. And a Punnett square um, is set up in a way like you can see here in this GIF, where you draw a square, and then you split it up into four smaller boxes, and you put the alleles of each parent on the outside of the box. So, for example, let's say you've got these two parents, a big T parent and a small T parent, and then the other parent is two small T's. You want to figure out what's the percent chance of these two parents having a kid who's a taster. So first thing you do is you make a box. Then you go, one of the parents' alleles gets separated out on top. Other parents' alleles here go on the side. The ones on top, you write straight down into the boxes below. The ones that are on the right, you write straight over into the boxes to the right. Inside those four boxes now, those are the four possible genotypes for their children. That would tell us then that there is a 50% chance, right, two out of four, that they're going to have a kid who's a taster, and a 50% chance they'd have a kid who's a non-taster. And that's the way you always will set these up. Now up to this point, we've been talking about alleles that were found on an autosome, which meant that it didn't matter whether you're male or female, that you had two copies of each um, allele. Now we're going to talk about X-linked traits. These are traits where the gene is found on the X chromosome. Because of that, that means that in a female's body cells, she contains still the usual two alleles, two copies, for these genes, because females are, remember, XX. X. But males are XY. So males don't have two Xs, so they only get one copy of it, and the Y doesn't have this. They only have one allele. An example of a condition that is an X-linked trait is hemophilia. This is an X-linked trait, but unlike the PTC taster, it's not dominant, it's a recessive trait. And we'll see how that plays out in a little bit. So we call it recessive, X-linked, means it's on the X chromosome, not on an autosome. So here are the different possible um, alleles that we have. To denote the presence on the X chromosome, we write the capital letter and the lowercase letter as a superscript. So X with a capital H is the dominant allele for normal blood clotting, because hemophilia is a condition where the blood doesn't clot normally, but it's a recessive condition, so the dominant one doesn't have it. X with a lowercase allele, the recessive defective allele for blood clotting, 
And then the y is always going to have a 0 as a superscript for an X-linked trait. Indicates the Y chromosome doesn't have this gene. Therefore, it has no effect on this trait. What we can do then is we can take all these alleles down here and put them together in all the possible combinations, all the different genotypes that we can list. So up here, these top three are two X's each. That means these are all female. Down here, we have the X's and the Y's, which means then that those are the, the males. Let's start with the males first. Whenever you're doing X-linked traits, start with the males first. They're going to be easier to figure out. So the Y we can ignore. The zero means it has no effect. So X with a big H, they have the dominant allele. In this case, they have normal blood clotting. They're not affected by this recessive condition. X with the lowercase h, well, now they are affected. They have problems with blood clotting. They do not clot properly. It's defective. We call them a hemophiliac in that case. So males, ignore the y. Look where they have the dominant or the recessive, and that tells you then whether they're affected or not by that condition. For females, if you have two of the dominant alleles up here, two big h's, that means that they're normal. They have normal blood clotting. We'll skip over this middle one and come back to it. Two of the recessive alleles, well, now they are affected because the recessive alleles can show up and have an effect. They are also hemophiliacs. But females have a third option, x to the big H, x to the small h. The reason I have this in parentheses here is the order doesn't matter. By convention, you always write the capital letter first. You also write x before y, you go alphabetical. But other than that, it doesn't matter. So big H, small h means that the dominant allele shows its effect. So she still has normal blood clotting. The recessive is being hidden, but it's there. It could be passed on to offspring, which means we call her a carrier, meaning that she's not affected by it, but she potentially could pass that on to her offspring. So how do we do a pedigree now for an X-linked trait, like hemophilia? Again, this is a recessive trait. Remember, before the darkened in ones, were um, denoting that trait PTC taster, which was a dominant trait. Here, darkened in is still showing the trait, but this is a recessive trait. Okay. So for X-linked traits, start with the males. Again, they're gonna be the easiest. What I also recommend is putting in the letters you're gonna use here. Right, so squares are males, circles are females. So for the males, the Y is going to have a zero on it, indicating it has no effect on this genotype or, or phenotype. Now here, this male is affected. He's showing this condition, this recessive condition. This is a hemophiliac. So to show the recessive condition, he must have this recessive allele. It's the only way he can be affected. Down here, this male's not showing it. He's not affected by it, so he must have instead the capital H, the dominant allele. Okay? After you've finished with the males, look to see if it's a recessive trait. Are there any affected females? If so, there's only one option for them. You flip back here. Only way a female's affected by it is if both copies are recessive. So down here, she's darkened in, she has hemophilia. She must have two recessive letters. Now up here, she's not showing it. So she must have at least one dominant. But we don't know, is her second letter a second capital H or is it a small h? So here we have to think a little bit. We have to look at the children to figure out that mother's second letter. I have so much trouble down here for some reason. Okay, all right, I give up. So this X with a big H was passed on down here to the son, and the Y came from the dad, but that doesn't tell us what the mother's second allele could be. However, this daughter down here has two recessive alleles. One of those came from dad, other one has to have come from mom, so this mom's a carrier. She herself is not affected, but she passed it on, in this case, to her child.
before I move on, hemophilia is still complete dominance. Capital letter and a lowercase letter, dominant and recessive. Now we're moving on to a new type of dominance relationship, codominance. Codominance is where you do not have one allele that's stronger than the other. Instead, they're both equally dominant. To denote that, we use two different capital letters, like in this example here with this chicken. A capital B for black feathers and a capital W for white feathers. If they're both present together, you get some feathers that are black and some feathers that are white. They both show up because they're of equal strength. So when they're expressed together, each allele affects the phenotype. It's very important here that they affect it separately, separately but equal, equally. Yeah, excuse me, separately but equally. That means that for codominance, black and white do not blend together to make gray feathers. Instead, they have black feathers by themselves and white feathers by themselves. So like I said, codominant is indicated with two different capital letters. In the example we'll talk about next, sickle cell disease, we have HB with a capital A, HB with a capital S, or just capital A, capital S for short, um, indicating two different codominant alleles. So sickle cell disease is not X-linked. Make sure that you look for that in a problem. Unless it says X-linked, do not use X's or Y's. It's autosomal, means we're using some different letters. X's and Y's are only for X-linked. So we have two alleles for sickle cell disease, HB with a capital A, that's the allele for normal-shaped hemoglobin. HB with a capital S, that's the allele for misshapen hemoglobin. And even though the one's misshapen doesn't mean it's recessive, both of those are equal strength, codominant alleles. So we have three possible genotypes and three possible phenotypes. Two of the HBAs means all of the hemoglobin is normal-shaped, which means that all of that person's red blood cells, because the red blood cells contain hemoglobin, also have a normal shape, which is kind of, you know, round, a donut with a little filled in center sort. Now if you have two HBSs, all of your hemoglobin is misshapen, which means that you have your red blood cells are all sickled, kind of like, like this. That's what we call sickle cell anemia. It's important to note this word, sickle cell anemia. Now if you have HBA, HBS, heterozygous, right, two different alleles, you have half normal-shaped hemoglobin and half misshapen hemoglobin, so you have both of the alleles. This means that usually you're producing normal red blood cells, but two different conditions will cause you to start producing sickled red blood cells. One of those is if you get exposed to malaria, so if you get infected by malaria, or you encounter low oxygen conditions um, from the outside that affects your body or inside your body from exercising really hard, things like going in an airplane, skydiving, climbing up a high mountain, things like that, can all lead to this trigger where then you start producing these sickled cells. This is called sickle cell trait. So sickle cell trait, you can think of it more as temporary, T for temporary. Sickle cell anemia is you always have the sickled red blood cells. Sickle cell disease, a little bit about this. There's a parasite that causes malaria. It's often transmitted by mosquito. When it bites you from that mosquito's saliva, the parasite goes inside your body, and it prefers to infect your red blood cells and also your liver cells. We're going to focus on the red blood cells for this um, topic, though. Actually, having sickle cell trait and sickle cell anemia, but sickle cell trait especially, so you have less downsides, gives you some protection against malaria. And there's two ways it does that. One is that these sickled red blood cells, their environment inside is a lot harsher. So when the parasite gets inside, it can't multiply as well and reproduce, and so the parasite levels don't get as high. It's easier for the body to maintain um, fighting those off. And secondly, the sickled red blood cells do not stay around in your body for as long. They get destroyed mainly by the spleen at a much faster rate than normal healthy red blood cells. 
So normal red blood cells last about a third of a year, 120 days before the end of their life. Sickle red blood cells, though, are destroyed about every three weeks, which means that when they get destroyed, the parasites that have infected them also get destroyed, and so you get rid of that virus faster. So individuals with sickle cell trait have a greater chance of surviving malaria than those who don't. That's why you'll find sickle cell disease much more prevalent in populations that are living or came from areas where malaria was a big, big problem or still is a big problem. So moving on now to our final part of this um, video lecture. That's talking now about a combination of what we've talked about. Three different alleles now instead of just two. And two types of dominance relationships that are interacting to control the genetics of our blood types. So for the alleles for blood types, you have I with a capital A, I with a capital B, so two different capital letters that indicates co-dominance. But then here you have a lowercase i. That's a recessive one that indicates that we had complete dominance here between the capital letters and the small one. So even though there are three alleles for blood types, that's like three alleles in a population, in a whole group of individuals. Every person just has two of them. But let's say, for example, that You know, here is one parent down here on the right, and here's another parent, right? Two alleles, I capital A, and this would be a small i. Oh my gosh, whatever. Over here, I capital B and a small i. So we have three alleles different alleles amongst those two people, but each person just has two of those alleles, one from each parent. So the two capital letter ones are co-dominant to each other, equal strength. That means that if they show up together, both of those will show their effects in the phenotype, having the A antigen and the B antigen being produced, causing that type AB blood. However, compared to the small letter, the recessive one, they are completely dominant. So here if you have I with a capital A and a small i, you still have type A blood because this small i is recessive, it's being hidden. Or here, I with a capital B and a small i, the small i is being hidden. The only way that small i is going to be able to show itself is if both copies are recessive. Then you can have type O blood. What that means, as we can see here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different genotypes. These are combinations of letters. But the phenotypes that result, those are the blood types here, right? The effects of having those genotypes. There are only four different phenotypes that you can have. This is just another view of that same thing, um, just kind of a more simplified version of it, I think. All right, so we'll be asked to do some more pun and squares and pedigrees relating to both the blood type genetics and uh, hemophilia and sickle cell disease. It's the same application as we went through before with the initial part. Um, if you have questions, as always, you know, just let me know.